I would like to begin this presentation with a big thank you to the people that have made my current academic endeavor possible. Without naming each one, indiv each one individually, I would like to thank both the Urban Studies Foundation and my mentor for, ve for their uncanny support, dedication and patience in dealing with my quirks, errant ideas, excitements and frustrations. The opportunity that the Urban Studies Foundation gave me of being and becoming the kind of engaged ethnographer I'd like to be, it's unique and I value it very, very much. So thank you once again also for the opportunity of being here today. Now, today I'd like to touch upon the following points. And here the title of this presentation is Assembling Life at the Margins, which is also the title of my research project. So the following points. First, I will offer an overview of my, of my research project, focusing on my research philosophy. Second, I will present three interrelated matters or working packages, the theoretical framework I'm working upon, the methodological approach deriving from it, and their political commitment and implications. These points taken together allow me to answer to some of the questions that Chris sent us in preparation for this event, which are related to the originality of the research and its implication both for urban studies and the realms of policy. I will then move to the presentation of the fieldwork that I'm about to conclude in Bucharest in Romania, focusing in detail on one of the case studies that I undertook there. In the end, I will conclude outlining what has been achieved until now in terms of publication and research impact. And I will also give an overview of what is next. So I know this is a lot of stuff, but you have asked for it and you also have paid for it. <laughs> so sit back, relax and enjoy it. <laughs> So I just want to mention that all the pictures that you are going to see in this presentation are made by myself because the kind of work that I do is also visual ethnography. So I hope you also enjoy the visual part of it, which is very relevant. And the pictures have been selected carefully. So I hope to, that they convey meaning as much as my work do. So let's start with a schematic overview of my research project. What, what I face in my research is a cultural problem. It is about how we conceptualize marginality and how we deal with it in European cities. When I say that the problem is of a cultural kind, I mean that I'm interested in the way these groups are represented and dealt with politically. Postcolonialism, feminist, queer theory, and poststructuralism have largely based their stances upon a similar premise to understand, challenge, and go beyond what Stuart Hall has called the system of representation, framing stereotypical views of the world. However, and despite these long-standing contributions, it appears to me that there is still much to learn and to say, particularly in relation to urban kind of marginalization. If the city is supposedly expanding everywhere, do we have the right theoretical, methodological, and political tool to assess marginality critically and non-normatively? And of course, we, we don't have all of this, otherwise my research would be meaningless. I tackle these points starting from the insights that I gained from my field activities. This is because I consider myself to be, first and foremost, an urban ethnographer. It is approaching the field with a particular sensibility, of which I will say in a moment, that I aim to foster readings of marginality that are critical in what they do not take the word for granted, attentive to the micropolitics of life, and contextually relevant. My current research is an intersection of several case studies. The first arises from my PhD ethnography of homelessness in Turin, Italy. It concerns the role that I have in the Housing First Network in Italy. This is a network made up of 45 Italian cities and organizations that are trying to implement a specific policy for homeless people in my country, and the name of the policy is, is Housing First. I'm part of the scientific committee researching this process, and I also provide training to practitioners in summer schools and webinars. At the moment, I have already collected data and written about the initial phases of this policy implementation, which I will expand in the forthcoming months through short case studies in at least a couple of Italian cities involved. Second, there is the ethnography I'm about to terminate in Bucharest. This can be divided into two parts. The first major one concerns a seven months ethnographic, ethnography of drug consumption and services to drug users in the city. 
I mainly focused on two specific areas of the city, the deprived and stigmatized neighborhood of Ferentari in the south of Bucharest and the, under <laughs> and the underground canals passing below the main train station called Gara de Nord. In these areas, one can find a considerable number of injectable drug users using mainly heroin and new psychoactive substances, as well as some service provider like the harm reduction center, which is essentially a rusty container uh, in the middle of Ferentari. Moreover, I did also ethnographic walks and ar archival research in other parts of the city, interviews with other service providers and institutions, including visits and interviews in the main penitentiary of the city, located out just outside Bucharest in the small village of Gilava. The other Bucharest fieldwork concerns the visual ethnography work that I did as a research and activist with a community of 100 Roma people whom in, in September 2014 had been evicted from their homes. From that moment on, half of these people have been dwelling on the sidewalks located in front of their old houses, and they are still there in improvised shacks since eight months. This research is related to street life, activism, race, politics, resistance, but I don't really want to enter into detail now in, on this particular research because I will say something more later on in my talk. Lastly, my third field activity, which is yet to start, will be related to a short-term ethnography of homelessness in London. I aim to investigate how a specific subgroup of homeless people, possibly migrant homeless, perform their daily life relying upon London's public infrastructure, namely buses, parks, sidewalks, etc. The aim is to look at those performances and those relations as a more than human endeavor that might allow me to say something new and meaningful about the marginal urban cosmopolitic of this particular metropolis. And of course I welcome any suggestion and comment because this fieldwork is, is yet to be planned and yet to start. As you can see, my research is related to extreme cases of marginalization in European cities, which could be analytically divided into two strands. So we have a sort of pinkish strand and a green strand. The pinkish strand is essentially about the study of homelessness and related policy in, the ci in cities of the North, South and East Europe. On the other hand, there is a specific case of drug users in Bucharest, which is about an in-depth ethnography ethnography, sorry, but will stand on its own in terms of publications and impacts. Since these research endeavors are part of my life, and to a certain extent, a large extent, they are my life, they reflect who I am. They are made of experimentations, shifting grounds, and heterogeneous intersections, as Chris knows very well. What holds them together and what keeps them moving is the fact that they are, that they are deeply rooted into a common ground, made up of three core areas. And the areas essentially are a vitalist theoretical framework, so it's about theory, a methodological quest about methodology, and the precise political commitment. The final aim of doing several ethnographies in different cities is not to compare the cases per se, or even the cities, but to follow Simone is to unfold a reciprocity. So essentially, this is a way, and here I'm quoting Simone, in which the details of one particular city can generate significant concepts that lead to a better understanding of urban processes. The development of this common ground, so essentially the theory, the method, and politics, along with the field activities that I have undertaken until now, are essentially the outcome of my first 14 months as Urban Studies Fellow. I'm going to describe these areas at length, hoping they will show how I intend to rethink contemporary urban marginality. So essentially now I'm going to enter into this description of the theory, the method, and politics. And then I will move into the description of the fieldwork that I have been doing in Romania. So let's start with theory. In most of the literature on urban marginality, the city seems to remain a backdrop for what humans perform, and too little is said about non-human agencies, machines, affective atmospheres, human, non-human, and discursive infrastructures. 
These are far from being only theoretical problems. Without accounting for the constitu constitutive relationship that links the city and its marginal subject, one cannot account for the subtle power at play in everyday urban micropolitics, both in their constrained and liberating effects. In other words, the way we see the marginal city matters for its politics. The literature around more than human agency uh, and urban atmospheres has begun to provide answers to some of the above questions. As the work of urban scholars like Chattopayai, De Boc, Graham, McFarlane, Simone, and Mai, Ashamin, show, as these works show, in these accounts, the subject and the city are on the same ontological plane. This is a vitalist plane where matter of class, gender, colonialism, and race are not discarded, but looked from the day-to-day -day micropolitics of, of entanglements between bodies, speeches, and materialities, and their related stances of power and affects. In the theoretical work that I'm undertaking, I'm interested in conceptualizing the relationship between the vitalist city and the post-human subject. So these two ideas, these two notions and concepts are central to my theoretical endeavor. So now I'm going to talk about the vitalist city first, and then I will move to the post-human subject. So what about the city? From a vitalist perspective, the city cannot be a place where, uh, to which we, as humans, react by means of practicing it, but a co-constituted space of what Nigel Trift has called outthinks, a new form of vitality, the, sit, the city as a sentient space. But what one does not to have uh, to disturb Trift or Deleuze to understand this. One is simply to listen to the city attentively, to walk through it, to take Glasgow subway and be guided by its machines, its code, its atmospheres. The city is alive, this is at the central point here, and we are alive through and with it. One could say that urban is precisely that web of life in which human and non-human, and here I'm quoting Robert Park, 1936, are bound together in a vast system of interlinked and interdependent lives, end quote. However, it is not anymore a matter of understanding urbanism as a way of life, but of understanding the main lives that makes up the urban. This is what Matthew Gandhi has called a neo-organicistic city. It is, in other words, what I call, what I'm working on, this idea of eco-logic, which means essentially a constant refrain of the heterogeneous machinic affiliations of life. And here, of course, I'm taking from, from Felix Gattari a productive rever reverberation of the multiple form of life taking place in the urban. Now, human subjectivity does need to be refought alongside the city. It has to be opened up to its wider environment to acknowledge its hybrid constituency. Examples in this sense can be found in the works of many continental thinkers, such as Lefebvre, Derrida, Butler and Foucault. The account that, however, offers the broader aperture on subjectivity is that of Deleuze and Gattari. Here, the social context is populated of machines, not only of bodies and speech. These are the vitalist machines that I have described before, machines that intersect with a subject who is, not, who is machinic by nature. And here, I just want to call Bignal when she says that a body is not a discrete entity defined by stable boundaries and a set of fixed characteristics. Rather, it is an assemblage of components bound into a coherent form, but this bodily consistency is only ever temporary, temporary and is always shifting. And here, of course, you can read Deleuze and Gattari through Bignal. It then became impossible to maintain the strict boundaries of the rational self. Rationality itself is a product and a producer of machines. In this sense, what Deleuze and particularly Gattari bring to the fore is not a defini definitive theory of the subject, but a broad rhizomatic canvas where the subject becomes with the other assemblages of the world. The production of human subjectivity can therefore only be grasped from a post-human point of view. And here, I'm referring, of course, to the work of uh, Rosie Braidotti and also of Maz Maurizio Lazzarato. 
they come from different perspectives, but they stress the collective nature of each subject, shaped by what they call molar machine, essentially discourses, stigmas, institutional apparatuses, and molecular kind of entanglements. I know this is kind of heavy theory, a lot of stuff put in a few slides, but now I'm going to unfold this into my, into my presentation. So this is for me a key point to rethink the urban and to rethink the city. Thinking about the urban as a vitalist mechanosphere and about the subject as uh, uh, post-human, essentially built within and with this particular mechanosphere. But how the two, the city and the subject, are actually bounded and co-constituted together? This is the question. So now I'm reflecting of, on a rather underdeveloped thought I'm starting to think that the city and the subject are co-constituted through affects. In the case of marginalized people, the entanglement of, of the subject and the machine of the city is to follow uh, an Australian geographer, uh, Catherine Robinson, at this location. The body is expelled from the home, it is moved around, it is stigmatized, it is counted, it is performed over, but that same body also performs and counteracts upon the dislocation itself. This movement, if you want also this kind of tension between the marginal subject and the city, is determined by the immanent capacity of both things, the subject and the city, to affect and to be affected one by the other. And this is why I'm saying that the dislocation and the relation is of, of an affective kind. And here, of course, again, I'm using affect in a Deleuzean sense. Essentially, it's the capacity of something, of affecting something else, and to be affected. It is matter of bodily dispositions, urban rhythms, cognitive and emotional capabilities, material features, programming, the law of man and the law of physics. It is a matter of the ecologic that I was referring before. In the constitutive entanglement between the city and the subject, these affect affective plays produce particular atmospheres that influence how one perceives their own status, their own life, and how one gets along with it. This is what Simpson has called the ecology of experience. Marginality is experienced and performed on the basis and through these affective encounters or ecologies. It is there that a new politics of the margin should and could be thought of. The challenge of a theoretical framework based on the vitalist city and the post-human subject, it is to find ways of drawing contextualized maps of the subject that move from the molecular to the molar and back again, which pass through and trace the affective dislocations of which I have said, in order to highlight what is at stake in the assemblage of marginalization in its everyday performative unfoldings. This point brings me into my next area, or work package, which is essentially about methodology. So this is all fancy theory, but how can we actually implement this in the field? So this is the kind of question I hope to reply now. <clears throat> and this picture here is taken from my field work in Bucharest with drug users in Ferentari. Approaching marginality from a vitalist perspective is a contextual endeavor, as McFarland put it. So let me give you an example about drug users in Bucharest living in the neighborhoods of Ferentari. This is a heavily stigmatized neighborhood located in the south of the city, mostly populated by Roma people and characterized by three areas that are considered ghettos. I just want to interrupt myself for a moment here. I'm seeing that you are kind of, you are looking at this picture and it's not entirely clear what's in the picture, but we, this is precisely the, the purpose of this picture. The picture is, is, is heavily contrasted and it has a, a very long casting shadow because the syringes are not entirely visible. And this is precisely how you feel when you perform the field. The field. You cannot see the syringes, but the syringes are there. So the picture wants to convey this message to you. So, three areas that are considered ghettos. 
I did part of my research around these places where one can find a considerable, a considerable con a concentration of users of heroin and new psychoactive su substances. Uh, the key point for me is to look at the two levels of subjectification I was referring before, the molar and the molecular. So at the level of molar subjectification, a drug user in Bucharest is assigned by the machine of the state, by capitalism, by the media, by the academic production of knowledge, to the category of marginalization. Her subjectivity is to be the junkie, the addict, the weak, the deprived poor, and in some cases also to be the zicano, essentially the gypsy, which is a very derogative term in Romania. This subjectification affects her both at the emotional level and, more importantly, at the political one. Policies are arguably enacted on the basis of this stereotypical and molar kind of knowledge. The level of molecular subjectification, on the other hand, operates at the more subtle level of day-to-day -day operations with the multiplicity making up life in the ghetto. She is related to the materiality of the place which are essentially made of cracking sidewalks, disrupted pipes, complex social rules and power dynamics, police intervention, NGO interventions, the law, tradition, social customs, the lack of facilities and the opportunities offered by what is at hand, by affects and fears, the aesthetic of life in the overcrowded blocks built for seasonal workers under Ceausescu's regime, plastic bags filled with clean syringes, tiny pieces of paper folded to contain a microdose of heroin, lack of distillated water to inject, broken needles, etc. Looking at the molar and the molecular allow us to understand that the subject is not individual, but plugged in the collective social machinery of the marginal city. The challenge of the kind of vitalist ethnography that I like to do and I want to do is to trace and describe this complex subject without reducing its dramatic complexity. So the fieldwork is ethnographic in nature and it could not be otherwise. And here ethnography is first and foremost about the body. It is not about doing interviews. Doing interviews is not ethnography. That is just a method. Doing the ethnography of the vitalist city and the post-human subject is about being in context with the molar and the molecular. It is about touching, it, it is about waiting, it is about walking, listening, talking, smoking, sniffing, being tempted and being pushed. It's also about pushing and making mistakes. It's about collecting stuff and engaging in effective relationship of these locations, in being sad, happy, in being consumed and stressed and excited and many other things. It is, in a word, about becoming other in the quest to write about the other. So here this picture is taken uh, in the underground canals that passes uh, uh, below the main train station in Bucharest. So now I, I, it's, it's a rather long, long thing to explain, but essentially in Bucharest there is a system that is called teleheating. So essentially the heating is brought in different places thanks to uh, hot water passing in pipes, underground, in underground pipes. In some parts of the cities, you have underground chambers that were built in order to maintain the pipes. And now in some of these places, you have communities of homeless people and drug users that are living there. Guess why? Because it's hot, it's warm, because the pipes brings the water. So here we are in the underground. And it is about being there with these people. Only being there with these people, you can actually start to see the kind of, the molecular kind of entanglements that they have this, with this place. So here, the picture, all these people are here are heavily addicted to heroin and other drugs. But the life that they perform here, it's something that you cannot really understand if you don't spend time with them and you don't actually engage with them. So here we have someone cutting the hair of someone else. People here are talking about the weather outside. Uh, they have a very complex system and infrastructure, material and social, in order to bring the light in, in the canals, which is quite an amazing achievement. And uh, many other things, they have scrap materials here that they collect from the outside, they bring down the canal, 
they, they separate the copper and the metal and they sell stuff outside. It is a complex social machinery which is deeply embedded with the infrastructure of Bucharest, the material infrastructure of Bucharest. And these subjects are deeply affected by the infrastructure itself. So this is the relationship between the vitalist city and the post-human subject. And looking at this relationship, what I aim to do is to deconstruct the category and the stigmatizing knowledge around drug users in Bucharest. I don't mean to diminish the problem of drug <coughs> consumption and drug addiction. I just mean to tackle it from a deep, different perspective. So this task is not easy. <clears throat> the big problem here is, of course, about positioning. And here I attend to positionality driven by the aim of producing pra practice-based, contextually relevant, and committed knowledge. In this sense, I follow Haraway when she claims that the only way to be objective about something, and here I quote, turns out to be about particular and specific embodiment, and definitely not about the false vision promising transcendence of all limits and responsibilities. This is about recognizing that if we cannot be the other, we also cannot be totally detached from the other. In the moment in which I enter the field, I become part of that collective subject. I'm into it, I'm part of it, I change it, and I change with it. The fieldwork in this sense is both, is both partial and objective, because it can be objective only being partial. Mapping the subject means to be attentive to the world with a particular sensibility, a sensibility that situates us in the midst of the world. With the, aim, with the aim not to box it, but to follow it, and to, <coughs> and to see where it cracks in order to highlight issues, but also potential. We may call this sensibility poetic, not because it's about romance, but because it's about potential, the potential of materiality, of meaningful positioning, of encounters. Deciding which method, methods to use in order to collect data is totally a secondary decision. It comes after the positioning, it is, and it is contingent to the context. In the case of the 100 Roma people, the evicted ones, I used videos and photo heavily, because that was what people asked me to do. In the case of drug users, I mainly smoked, walked, and talked, because that was what the context was able to offer. So the maps arising from this kind of ethnographic endeavors are always partial, unfinished, and provisional. They can, however, allow for those cultural and practical changes I was referring to at the beginning of my talk. Mapping is indeed about casting new lights into the micropolitics of the margins. Pile and Thrift have described this endeavor as a tripartite movement, which beautifully summarizes my argument so far. Mapping the subject is done in order to redrawing the old maps, re-symbolize the old maps, but also to, to find ways to, to produce new maps of the subject. And here again, maps are, are not only discursive, but are also visual. The pictures that I selected to, to show you the canals are this one and this one. In, in a sense, they aim to to convey a particular meaning about the life in this place, which is not the traditional, you know, I'm injecting myself. Because that particular image, although it's part of that context, is, is only going to reproduce the knowledge, the stigmatizing knowledge that you already, not you personally, but in general the society, already have in relation to this subject. What you see in this picture is someone taking a coffee, three meters downstairs, and he is holding a syringe. So, in doing this particular work, we are also doing politics. And here I'm arriving at my third point. Mapping the subject in this particular way is political per se, but this is not enough. The risk is of producing knowledge unable to leave the ivory tower in which we live, which is essentially this one here today, which is beautiful, but we need to leave this tower. The main issue is that academics have not tried enough to speak other languages, to cross boundaries, and to perform new terrains of action. 
In my work, I explore creative methodologies such as narrative writing and photography, and I engage in volunteering and activism in order to bring my findings behind academia. However, to make this transpassment relevant, one condition has to be met. Creative methodologies, volunteering and activism needs to be seen as means for political action, not as ends. If both methodologies are to become tools for radical scholarship, their hand has to be the enactment of that third space between academia and activism that was argued for by Rutledge. Practicing and enacting this space is about po positioning, as syndicates put it, in between our custom and role and the other, in ways that are not limited to the acknowledgement of a hybrid positionality, but committed to radical engagement and change. This is what in my work I call translating the field. It means to, to do a particular kind of work needed to perform practical action. And here I'm also drawing in the, on the work of Ben Fruberg on the notion of pronesis that he takes from Aristotle, of course. In these two photos, you see myself and uh, some other guys here. In the, here we are doing a summer school in the Housing First Network in Italy. And I'm just listening to these people and I'm trying to, to engage with them about this notion of Housing First, which essentially is a policy that was done in, in, in the US. And now, in the Italian context, they are just trying to translate it, uh, as, it as it is, okay? Without really doing the necessary work of contextualization. So there is an engagement with these people in order to, to broaden up the issue. Totally different here, I'm with activists it was something like uh, 11 p.m. In, in Bucharest in November, very cold, and we are discussing about the eviction and the eviction that I'm going to uh, tell you about in a moment. So it's very contextual, very different context. I mean, very formal context, very informal one. The mode of enactment depends upon the audiences one aim to engage, but also upon the constituencies making up that particular third space that we want to perform. According to my field size and to my role in each site, in my current research project, I pursue translation in different ways. So for instance, ah, sorry. I pursue translation in different ways because translations are always contextual. So for instance, in the case of the evicted people, I set up this blog, which I will say in a moment. I essentially provided the infrastructure for these people to express and uh, the blog is written entirely by these people. I wrote in and provided my picture for kind of alternative uh, left-wing publications, grassroots publications in Bucharest. Uh, before, I wrote a novel in order to translate my homeless fieldwork in Italy into Italian uh, to, for practitioners. I was bringing buckets and clean syringes in the underground canals. And here, you see myself with the people I've been working with, with the NGOs, when they eventually got a prize. And they were so kind to inviting me um, for, for receiving this prize, although I'm not formally part of the organization. So each political translation is very contextual. All these are very time consuming and tiring activities, but sometimes seem completely unrelated to the task that one as researcher should perform. But they are not. To me, they are an integral part of my research endeavor. They are a way to state my positionality in the field even more clearly and to enact in a sense the kind of minor politics needed to meaningfully rethink marginality. So what I did until now, I gave you an overview essentially about the three points that characterizes my research. My different field activities share the same theoretical background, a vital stake on the city and the subject, they also share the same methodological approach, which is about ethnographically mapping the urban marginalized subject. And they are enacted through different methods, walking, listening, observing, filming, photographing, interviewing, depending on the context. Lastly, they are translated into political action in different forms that are always context related, but united by the same aim. And the aim is to produce a cultural alternative to marginalization, to understandings of marginalization to multiply difference and action and thoughts. It is to do what Foucault beautifully wrote in the introduction to, to Anti-Oedipus, in which he said, 
but we need to develop action, thought and desire by proliferation, juxtaposition and disjunction, and not by subdivision and pyramidal hier hierarchization. Of course, again, this sounds very theoretical, but I think that I'm trying to implement this idea in my own research through theory, practice, and methodology. Okay, so this was, if you want, the first half of my presentation. Now, I, I really want to say something about my, my fieldwork in Bucharest. Fieldwork in Bucharest, well, essentially seven months and a half. I put some numbers here, uh, just because, to give you a sense, but the fieldwork has been, most of all, about uh, observing and spending time with people. So the only reason why I have so many diary entries, which I think now are more than that, 200 entries, it's just because I was every day in the field. I mean, the field essentially was my life in Bucharest and still is to a certain extent. Some of these entries are not entirely relevant, but still they are part of what I have tried to do. In, field work, in Bucharest, I did two things. The first project, the main one, was about this idea of the infrastructure of drugs in Bucharest. And this particular fieldwork uh, is going to, as I said before, is going to, uh, to become, uh, is, is going to feed into particular uh, publications that are going to stand on its own. So I aim, and my project is, to write a monograph, a kind of ethnographic monograph about this idea of drug consumption, the infrastructure of drugs in Bucharest. And the second fieldwork was about <coughs> The 100 Roma people that have been evicted, and now I will tell you why it's important, uh, this particular case, and it's about eviction, race, and micropolitics. The two fieldwork activities are not entirely the same. First off, I did this work with, with drug users and service providers, mainly during the daytime. While I did the work with the people, the evicted people, mainly during the late evening and night which makes a huge difference. Again, it's partial, but I had to negotiate my time in the field. Second, the methodology is also slightly different. You will see, because I'm going to present about this one, but here I used a lot video and photo. So I essentially did a visual ethnography with the evicted people, which was not entirely possible with the drug users and service providers. So I have some visual material taken from the first fieldwork, but not enough to call it a visual ethnography because it was not the right tool to use in that particular context. And uh, the other big difference between the two is that the second, the, the second fieldwork, it has, has seen me as an activist, first of all. So I started to get involved in this particular, uh, in this particular project, if you want, as an activist, not as a researcher. I turned into a researcher later on I changed my positionality in the field later on, but I started as an activist. While the first one, I had a very limited activist endeavor, okay? I will have in the future, if things go as I hope they will go, if my research is going to have any impact in Romania, but for now, only the second one is about activists <coughs> and research. So I essentially, I'm, I'm essentially going to present about the second one, I'm going to present a draft paper to you, so you are lucky enough to have a presentation within a presentation. Um, just because I want feedbacks on this paper is, is going to be the first outcome of this fieldwork that I'm about to finish now. And I'm not going to say anything more about the first one because I still have to engage in the analysis of data. So before I gave you some ideas, and of course I'm, I will be happy to reply to any uh, curiosity or questions that you have. So this particular case it's about this eviction I've been telling you about. And I call this paper Inertia Creep, Eviction, Enactment and Entanglement. So here I'm playing with this idea of inertia. As I use, I use inertia as a way to understand the affective dislocations that I have been telling you before. So essentially when people arrive in the street, they start to learn and to live in the street and there is an inertia at play in what they do. And I just want to see if this concept is able to deliver uh, the kind of ideas that I would like to deliver. The main aims of this paper are essentially to understand how things articulate in micropolitics, so on the day-by-day -day, uh, uh, activities of these people, 
And I also want to understand what is the role of inertial power in shaping micropolitical endeavors. And the last question is, how can we actually strengthen resistance? It will become clearer in a second. Just a bit of context. On the 16th of September, 2014, and I was in Romania only since two weeks or maybe three, 100 Roma people have been evicted from their houses in a street called Vulturi Rolcinzec near Bucharest city center. It's very close to the main square, Union Square in Bucharest. Why they have been evicted? Well, there is a bit of context here. Essentially, in 2001, the Romanian parliament uh, approved the law that is called retrocedari law. Essentially, this law allow someone to get back his or her house if this house was nationalized during the communist period. There is a huge difference with other similar laws that took place in Eastern Europe. In other countries in Eastern Europe, there are similar laws, but the owner get a financial compensation for the house. In Bucharest, what happened is that the owner get the, the, the physical house. So if you can prove that you or either some of your uh, uh, relatives was the owner of a particular house who has been nationalized, you can get the house back. So that, this is exactly what happened in 2002 on this particular property. This, proper, this property was retrocedat. Now, the law obliged the, the new owner to to lease the property for five years to the people that are actually living in the premises. So for five years, from 2002 to 2007, people are allowed to stay in this particular property that has been retrocedat. In 2007, the owner sold the land and the litigation rights to a firm managed by a Norwegian citizen. And this is very common. What usually happens after the fifth year, people sell houses, which are usually very beautiful, this one is, is a 19th century house, to some financial investor from other parts of Europe or the world. What this guy does from 2008, essentially, to 2014, he doesn't do anything at all. Why? Because in, in 2008, you all know, global financial crisis, it was not the right moment to do anything with that house. So essentially from 2008 to 2014, people are stealing the house, the owner, the new owner, the Norwegian fund is not doing anything, but also the state and the local measure and the local district is not doing anything. Everybody knew in that particular context that the people sooner or later were going to be evicted. But for five years, no one does anything at all. The only thing that eventually happened in 2014, all these people get evicted. Evictions on the basis of Law 10-2001 are daily business in Romania. They are very common. And from the eviction, people decided to dwell in the street in front of their houses. And this is not common. What usually happened in Bucharest, as my Romanian friend told me, is that people got evicted and they just moved somewhere else. Unfortunately now, there are so many of these kind of evictions that it's very hard to rely on the social network that you have on your relatives because they cannot accommodate you anymore. So in this particular case, half of these people, at the beginning, at the beginning they, they were 70, later on they were just 50, 50 people decided to dwell in the street to protest essentially and to demonstrate against this particular system of evictions. So, I want to play with this idea of inertia creep. Uh, where I get the idea from? Well, I get the idea from uh, Professor Robert Denaya of the University of Bristol. He essentially says that inertia creep is about being in a situation and knowing you should be out of it, but you are too fucking lazy or weak to live. The idea is a combination of movements propelling yourself forward and pulling yourself back at the same time. That's what inertia is about, is a fucked up relationship. And the fact up relationship here is, of course, that between the Romanian state and the Roma people. And of course, Robel and Naya is not a professor. He's the DJ of Massive Attack. <laughs> the idea of machinic inertia, which is the kind of traditional understanding of inertia, of course, comes from Isaac Newton. And essentially, Newton tells us that inertia is about resistance and impulse. And they really like this idea. Is the inertia that you 
experience when you are in the metro station, on the train, on the bus. So essentially, there is a force coming towards you, you resist that force, but in order to resist that force, you need also to propel yourself forward. So you have also this kind of impulse. Here is the evicted houses. So everything has been demolished. Inertia, on this, in the micropolitics of the social field, for me, it's about resistance and impulse. And why I use also the idea of creep? Because in inertia, when there is this play of resistance and impulse, things, in a way, change. They uh, deform, okay? The, the whole social field, in, in a way, deform. And inertia creep is also weird because it's very hard to see it. It's very hard to, and here again, it's another important point I will make at the end. It's very hard to see how this particular inertia plays, but it's important to see how it plays in order to strengthen resistance and strengthen micropolitics. Inertia is micropolitical because it's played at the level of the body, of the street, of the machines making up the urban, of everything I said before in the theoretical introduction. So now I'm going to divide the presentation of my visual ethnography in three parts, which are essentially three movements, which I called eviction, enactment, and entanglement. The reason why these movements are separated is just because I'm not able to say three things at the same time. But if I was able, I would speak about these things at the same moment, because they are only analytically separated. They actually take place at the same space in the same time, more or less at the same time. So let's start with eviction. The eviction, of course, was portrayed in all the media in, uh, in Bucharest. I got five? I got five, great. In all the media in Bucharest. So essentially, there is a very stigmatizing language here Troubled eviction, gypsies, which is a very derogative term, living illegally for 20 years, which is not true because these people had contracts, threatened to kill themselves, and for this reason, we had to call the police. Actually, the police was called precisely to evict the people. So we have a culture of racism against the Roma in Romania, which is a very long-standing thing. You start from the 14th century, where Roma people were in slavery, it moved on, during the communist time, essentially this quote here is, sell, is telling you that uh, people were, uh, got the job during the communist time, but we, we, they were still stigmatized as Cigani. And then, nowadays, collective evictions affect most Roma neighborhoods. And they also have inferior accessibility to housing. In the eviction, and this is a quote from a woman here that has been evicted, uh, People look like they have been through an earthquake or some sort of big calamity. They keep telling us we must leave and free the sidewalks and that they will help transport our belongings using vehicles from Rosal. And Rosal is the garbage disposal company in Bucharest. So even in the practice of evicting, you can see what I'm talking about. Eviction, for me, maintains the inertia of everyday racism in Romania. It is a status quo entangled with global flows of state capitalist endeavors territorialized on the bodies of the racialized poor. The status quo is sustained through resistance without accommodating the one in needs and through law design, but also through impulse, because the police went there and beat, beat pe people up and destroyed everything, as you can see. People's lives are simply expelled, to use Saskia Sassen terminology. Now, Enactment. What is this enactment about? Well, essentially it is about activism and resistance. I, I had the video to play here, but I completely ran out of time, so no videos for you. Activism and resistance. The, we have NGOs at play, activists at play with different perspectives, but also the people. The, the, the enactment, so in a way, the stand up against the eviction was enacted precisely by the people that we say to me, either we die, either we leave. We, no one is going to take us in, because you have to imagine that these Roma family are very big. So like 15 people in one family with a lot of kids, they are stigmatized, so it's very hard for them anyway to get someone renting a flat to them. Plus, they have all these kids, and this, this is difficult. And, and third, they usually have jobs in the informal economy. So it's very hard for them to demonstrate that they actually got the money to rent a place. Enactment is about building a camp outside in the street. It's about protesting in the main square of Bucharest. It is about you know, showing that they have rights and documents. And it's about day-to-day -day, you know, operation with the police. 
And all these things are quite unique for the Bucharest context. So enactment is a movement, a performance, disturbing the inertia of housing policy in Bucharest. The state is surprised but maintain its position because essentially what the state told these people, we are going to help you in, in which way we are going to put yourself in shelters. So mother and kids in a shelter, father in another shelter, which was totally unacceptable for these people. So they continue to protest, but the state actually maintained its, iner its inertia. It didn't provide any sort of solution on social housing for eight months. What is entanglement? And here I hope to finish quite soon. So entanglement is a key part in this process. Here we can read this quote. Essentially, this woman here, after six months, she's telling me, we really didn't have any slap out of despair. We can't go to work because we are afraid that we'll, they will take away our things again. This way, they will throw away the clothes that we have left. So the entanglement here is the constitution of a new subjectivity. Because when you live in the street for eight months and you entangle yourself with lack of sanitation, reduced mobility, lack of facilities, cold weather, provisional dwelling, reduced financial capability, you are going to change the way you think and the change you act in the urban is going to change completely. What happened is that this particular entanglement with the machines of the urban, with the daily life of the camp, with this life, with these things, actually brought to solitude a new conflictuality between the people. People started to divide. At the beginning, they were a united front. At the end, after eight months, they are divided. Someone, someone wants to leave, someone wants to do something else. And this affects also the way in which activists and NGOs respond to people themselves. In the, the enactment is, is about, the entanglement is about this these things here, the shacks, being alone and afraid. I'm wasted. I'm having a nervous breakdown. We spend the entire winter outside in the cold, being sick with sick children. We are finished. And this is a quote from a man just a couple of months ago, after six months in the street. So entanglement, in entanglement, we have a new inertia that comes to the fore. A new habits are learned, a new sociality performed, new codes implemented, new atmosphere embodied. It is the rise of the homeless subject. Entanglement works at the level of resistance because people struggle to maintain health and to challenge their new condition as homeless and also as impulse because they really want to protest and to keep on protesting, but they are pulled back by the fact that they live in the streets. So again, this kind of tension of inertia playing. What happened is that this inertia conflicts with NGOs, strategies, and aim. People are increasingly left alone, and activists might demotivate, because people don't really want to go to the square to protest anymore, and activists don't understand this. So essentially, the activists are really less present in this particular field because of the inertia that take place in entanglement. My last point is that the micro-political challenge of this particular eviction is that Activists and people need to acknowledge and confront the inertial power at play in their own micro-political entanglement. Essentially, to translate this in plain English, we need to take uh, into consideration these things here. The fact that you hang your clothes to a public toilet for seven months is going to change the way you enact the micro-political. And this is something that activists and NGOs supporting these people are not really taken into account because it's very weird, it's very difficult to see this kind of inertia at play. We have a blog, you can follow it. Now, essentially to conclude, I have two slides in which I, I wanted to summarize what it has been achieved in these 14 months. And uh, in terms of, I'm going to speak mainly about publications here because I already told you about my political kind of involvement. For coming publications, well, I have a few things. There is a book coming up, an edited book, edited by myself, that is called Rethinking Life at Margin. 16 beautiful chapters written by young academics around the world, US, Australia, Africa, and a few, a couple of big names in the book as well. I'm just selling the product here. It's, it's a very good book. I hope it's going to be very good. And it's essentially about the things I've been telling you about today. It's an edited book, so it's not only about me, but about people that are trying to think marginality in this particular way. 
I have a chapter with Colin McFarlane, which is called Infrastructural Becoming in the new book of Farias, Ignacio Farias and Nanders' blog, which is called Urban Cosmopolitics. This particular subject is very close to this idea of the vitalist city and the post-human subject, how the two work together. And we are particularly looking at sanitation policies here. I look at the homeless in Europe, Collins look at sanitation practices and policies in, in, policies in New Delhi. I have a book, uh, no, sorry, not a book, a chapter in a book, which is called The City and the Marginal Man, Machinic Subject, once again. Here, it's a kind of, it is, it is in the forthcoming book, Deleuze and the City, by uh, press, Edinburgh University Press. It's again this uh, Deleuzean uh, take on marginality, which for me, this chapter is a bit of a closure with that kind of uh, playing heavily with Deleuze. I want to move a bit away from it. I want to uh, improve, but that chapter was needed for me to, to close it up. And then I have a, a paper written in Italian about housing first, because I'm doing housing first in Italy. It needs to be written in Italian. Um, few papers under review, one with Antipode in particular, which, which I hope is going to get through, because it's about this idea of translating the field, so being activist and research researcher as well. And uh, I want to write it up, this particular paper I presented to you today. And then my, the biggest thing I want to do in the year that I have left, in the year and a half that I have left as urban studies scholar, is to, to write a major monograph, which I aim to submit to important American or European publisher on drug consumption in, and, 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 and services to drug users in Bucharest. I won the Institut Cultural Roman Foreign Research grant, 3,000 euro, but I actually cannot use the money because I, I, I won it when I already finished the fieldwork. And uh, they were supposed to give me the outcome in September, but they didn't. They gave me the out, outcome one month ago, so probably I'm, not, I'm never going to see the money, but I won it. And they submitted an application to Antipod Research Activist Award, Award to work with drug users in Bucharest. I hope this is going to get through. Essentially, this is just what I want to do what I'm going to do in the next months, there are a few talks, actually quite a lot of talks around in Marcel, in Durham, always about the theory I'm trying to implement, engagement in Italy with housing first. On the Mucarest material, I already told you about what I plan to do, write in the book and uh, present the eviction paper, uh, a revised version of this paper uh, in some other conference and to start to do this part-time three, four months ethnography in London, which I really want to get with this kind of ethnographic work in London, the last, you, if you want, uh, area that I'm missing at the moment, you know, seeing marginality in a major uh, uh, European city, which is not located in the south and in the east. I'm really sorry if it took too long. Thank you. <laughs>